evening I'm Brendan Boyle, Associate Dean for Graduate Programs in Cal College Annapolis. I'm glad to see you all here. It's a very great pleasure for me to introduce Jackie Murray, Professor of Classics at the State University of New York, Buffalo. My colleague and predecessor in this position, Edwin Langston, had been trying for some time to bring Professor Murray to campus. I'm very glad we were finally able to arrange it. I'm also very grateful to Professor Murray for the generosity she showed the Jeanette community over the past couple of days. From the very first email I received from Professor Murray, I had confidence that she would be a lovely fit for a lecture at St. John's College. It read as follows. Hi, Brendan. Looking forward to coming. Will you be arranging the hotel? <laughs> now, you might wonder how such a message could give me the confidence that she would find the St. John's College community a very welcoming place. Fair enough. But if one looked to the bottom of the message, below that signature line, one found a bevy of quotations a Greek proverb, a line from Plutarch, one from Theocritus one from Nietzsche, one from Henry James, and one from Batman. <laughs> I leave aside remarking on the last and focus on the lovely range of what preceded it. Here was a scholar on the search for wisdom wherever it could be found, all of which is reflected in her very wide-ranging and very erudite scholarship on Hellenistic poetry, Plato, race and ethnicity in the classical world, and the reception of classical antiquity in Black America. But the more that I looked at that bevy of quotations, the more I recognized that this was a scholar in search of a particular kind of wisdom that this college finds congenial. So the quotation from Plutarch, quote, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be kindled. So Theocritus, all that comes from friends is precious. I think that St. John's College tries to put those two thoughts together in the joint kindling through friendship of the minds of those who join us here. And by joining us here, I want to most emphatically include all those who are joining us colleagues, alumni, friends of the college, and current students, both low residency students and those here on campus for the summer. But we welcome especially Professor Jackie Murray in that spirit of vessel kindling friendship to deliver tonight's lecture entitled Slavery, Racism, and Racecraft in Plato's Republic. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jackie Murray. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Brendan, for that nice introduction. I'll keep it sweet and <laughs> short. <laughs> so um, yeah, I will um, present to you a work in progress that's actually in progress with my soon to be no longer next door neighbor, because <laughs> I'm moving to Buffalo and my, with my next door neighbor at the University of uh, Transylvania University in, in Lexington, Kentucky. So we live next door and he's a professor of philosophy. He's a professor of philosophy and um, ancient philosophy, and we live next door to each other, and we've had these wonderful conversations about our mutual interest in Plato and uh, the lack of interest that we've observed in, um, in the scholarship on the images of slaves in Plato, where there's lots and lots and lots, but there's very little scholarship on it. And so we would always have these conversations, and then so we decided that let's just write a book about it. So that's what we're, we're working on. Uh, and it's a book that'll um, try to explore the ways in which Plato uh, presents slaves as actual actors in some of the dialogues. It's gonna look at the use of um, the, cog or sort of, I guess, uh, conceptual metaphors connected to slavery that he also uses. And, and um, 
and his discussions, explicit discussions about slavery. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so and we're looking forward to it because it's 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 new, and we're shocked that whenever philosophers go, oh, I didn't realize there was so much. I'm like, yeah, there is. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I'm going to begin today with this paper, which explores the relationship between race, slavery, and injustice in Plato's Republic, um, as it is reflected in the transformation of the ideal state, the beautiful city, um, henceforth, I'm going to refer to it as the Kallipolis, which is the Greek for beautiful city, um, to its most unjust state, the tyranny. And of course, it goes through um, oligarchy, well, democracy, oligarchy, democracy, and tyranny, to remind you how that devolution happens. So given how, the found, how foundational Greek philosophy and philosophical discourse has been to modern discourses, and especially the um, theories of race, and to uh, justifications of slavery, it's remarkable that Plato's treatment of the topic has received so little attention. Uh, we surmise that uh, one reason um, for the neglect is that the dialogue format puts uh, some critical onus on the reader, um, more so than a treatise. So we can't really ever get at what is Plato really thinking because he's always putting things in his character's mouth. So getting at the views uh, brought forward through Socrates requires a combination of approaches ranging from philosophical analysis to phil philological close reading to discourse theory. And most philosophers tend to just stick to the first one. <laughs> so um, that's why our collaboration um, might be useful. So the dialogue, um, can't simply be mined for statements about slavery without due consideration to the language being used, the metaphors, the speech context, the focalization, the, any irony or sarcasm, and other forms of, uh, of discourse. And not to mention the historical context in which uh, the dialogue is set and the audience um, of the text. Moreover, each dialogue has to be understood on its own, and this is one of the things that we insist on, and not as part of an assemblage of statements and arguments from dialogues that mention slavery or race. So you can't just pop around and say, okay, in the laws he says this, and in the Republic he says this, and in Mino he says this, and put them all together, we have, hey, we have a great, that's not, um, we don't think that that's a useful approach. Um, primarily because each dialogue is in itself a self-contained artistic unit, and so it's therefore uh, important to treat it as such. And moreover, some of the dialogues are written so far apart from each other, particularly the laws is the last dialogue that Plato wrote. We, it was still in wax, <laughs> so not even in the press yet. Um, and so it's, we don't think it's reasonable to assume that over a lifetime, uh, the philosopher would have maintained the same views, um, especially given the way in which he presents uh, philosophical um, education to go, that it, you're learning all the time. However, the more troubling excuse we find uh, for not attending to Plato's views um, on the relationship between race, slavery, and injustice is the false assumption that Plato was just not interested in the subject. And this means uh, that this seems to be the origin of the widely held notion that Plato held views about race and slavery that aligned well with those of Aristotle. So let's just read Aristotle since he has a treatise and move on. Accordingly, uh, with a few exceptions, most scholarship, especially up until recently, um, just assumes that in the Republic, the Callipolis is a slave state. So, so we're going to argue in the, we argue then that the republic, uh, whereas a uh, so we, we argue that in the republic, whereas a naturalized hierarchy is crucial to maintaining this just government, slavery and racial oppression are absent and antithetical to this concept of the just state. Uh, significantly, in the first polity that that comes after the, the fall of the Callipolis, the timocracy. 
The noble lie ceases uh, to function as it was intended, that is as an ideology to maintain just government by making the uh, members of the state assume that they are a family. So not only is uh, social mobility introduced into the new uh, less just state, but uh, the idea that the various kinds of people in the state, that is the gold, silver, bronze, and iron, are no longer uh, the same family. With the fall of the Calipolis, slavery becomes integral to the descending order of unjust states, unleashing a pernicious form of freedom that becomes more and more unrestrained with each devolution of the polity, making the descent to tyranny inexorable. So I'm going to divide the talk then into four sections. We'll probably just deal with three <laughs> for time's sake, but the, the original talk is four. And so we'll begin by exploring the way race, slavery, and injustice are represented at the outset of the dialogue, focusing on especially Galakon's telling of the Ring of Gyges. And then next we're going to turn to the uh, communis opinio that Plato's ideal state, the Republic, uh, in the Republic, the Calipolis was a had a substantial uh, enslaved population. Uh, so despite the popularity of this view, uh, we argue that there is strong reason to think that uh, there is in fact either absolutely no slavery at all or a very minimal amount, perhaps just for prisoners, but we'll come to that. Next, we turn to the discussion of the transition to book two, in book two, that is from the first idea of the, uh, the, the just state, the one Socrates proposes, um, usually called the city of pigs, to the luxurious city, the um, Calipolis, and the transition in uh, book eight then to the, the fall of the Calipolis, starting with the timocracy. So in the Calipolis, Plato's account of the noble lie operates as an ideology that rationalizes and naturalizes the political and social hierarchy. Uh, and in the, in the democracy, the presence of slavery is one of several indicators that the original ideology of the noble lie ceases to function as intended and has been transformed um, to accommodate new political uh, and social order. And then finally, in the fourth section, we turn to the emergence of tyranny out of democracy, focusing on Plato's account of the tyrannical person who is enslaved to his runaway appetites and desires. Okay, so hopefully that's, yeah, we can see the roadmap. <laughs> okay, so first, we'll begin by clarifying what we mean by race. Now, a lot of discussion um, about that, uh, since a lot of people uh, don't necessarily think that race existed in antiquity, uh, mainly because we consider race as we understand it today, having to do with uh, skin color, dark skin, light skin, um, African, sub-Saharan Africans, this kind of um, distinctions, genetics, etc., cetera, um, and that this uh, construction of race is the only construction of race. So the tendency then is either to be in, to, has either to um, retroject uncritically modern racial categories um, without concern that this very act of retrojecting um, is in itself uh, crucial to the construction of our modern uh, racial hierarchies. And then the other, so by that I mean we assume that the Greeks were white, i.e. actually Northern European in some, some strange way, um, because we want them to be, and because they are, um, they just, the, the whiteness is created out of that. Um, or the other uh, option is to assume then that there was no race or racism in antiquity because it hasn't happened yet. So there's a, this, is, this, this uh, sort of circular idea that the only racism, race uh, exists in the, in the world is the one we have. And it's all, if it existed in the past, it was the same. Um, when in fact, that's 
actually um, turns out not to be the case. But that doesn't mean that just because the um, ancient Greeks did not um, see uh, black people as inferior to themselves um, doesn't mean that they also that they didn't have people that they did think were inferior to themselves, right? So, um, and uh, had no problem um, enslaving and um, wiping out. So Plato's Republic, which portrays uh, Socrates and Glaucon uh, constructing a naturalized hierarchy in which the different categories of people in the state are ranked according to some alleged ability to rule and justified by reference to some kind of metallurgic uh, schema, um, actually proves that, that this can't be the case, that they didn't have race or racism in antiquity. We are actually watching them do it, create um, a racial hierarchy right in front of us. And in fact, the presentation of the Lova lie makes it clear that Plato and his contemporaries understood race the way most modern theorists do today, i.e. as a social construction. Now, the model of race we use um, is going to be in keeping with Plato's representation of ancient Athenian concepts and, and the work at, of modern theorists of race, theorists of race. So we recognize that race as a socially constructed system of categorizing people um, and of placing them in um, oppressive hierarchical relations with one another. So race is also the violent dehumanizing processes that force groups into uh, the categories of inferiority and subjection in the hierarchy, as well as the authoritative discourses that justify, naturalize, um, and uh, uh, make it possible for people to accept the dehumanization of members of these so-called inferior categories and gives people the license to treat members of these categories um, in, in ways that express superiority or inferiority. So race is a hierarchical, the contingent social construct, meaning that the racial hierarchies that um, come into being are totally dependent on the historical circumstances in, out of which they come. And they are justified depending on the uh, authoritative nature of the discourses at that time. So in antiquity, mythology was a authoritative discourse, right? So you would justify various racial categories through mythology. Today, science, genetics, is an authoritative discourse. And so and for, uh, for the last 200 years or so, um, scientific discourse has been used to justify the racial categories. Crucially, the justifying and naturalizing um, discourses also differ as racial hierarchy evolves and adapts to historical circumstances. So all racial hierarchies, ancient and modern, slot people within and without the society in ranked groups, designating one group, almost always the ruling elite, um, or those aspiring to be, as uh, superior to the rest, that is the absolute best of humanity, and at least one other group as inferior, that is less than fully human, even monstrous. However, the, the, the criteria used to classify the superior and inferior groups can vary depending on whatever historical factors are in play. And um, as, uh, as the discourses used tend to justify and naturalize them and the hierarchy itself. So, Regarding um, these justifying and naturalizing discourses, we tend, in our, in our discussion, we tend to draw on the work of scholars Barbara and Karen Fields in their theorizing of the concept racecraft. Um, and they use this concept to capture the sum total of the processes that inculcate a collective belief in um, a given racial hierarchy. So the noble lie then fits precisely onto what fields and fields call racecraft. The myth harnesses all of the social, civic, political, legal, religious, and cultural 
epistemic resources of the Kallipolis to create the collective understanding that the metallurgic hierarchy, that is the gold, silver, bronze, and iron, um, that this explains the membership in the society and explains why things are the way they are and why they need to stay that way. However, as uh, my co-author David has argued elsewhere, uh, there is an equally authoritative countervailing argument or discourse that is presented with the noble lie. Um, that is that the members of the Calipolis are a family. And this seems to go against the hierarchical structure by saying, claiming they're all of the same blood, they're all made in the earth, they're all um, one family, and, um, and they get rid of the individual families, if you'll remember, and have just one family, wives in common, children held in common, and they're all one big happy family, I guess. So we argue then that it is this innovative discourse, or uh, yeah, sort of as is a check, this idea of the family um, is a check on the metallurgic hierarchy, which has a very clear, obvious uh, tendency toward um, a perniciousness, especially when we consider that um, in, in, in Athens, uh, these metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, were the currency, right? So we're literally valuing people, the gold people, more than the iron people. They are, this is, uh, you know, a billion dollar coin and this is a penny. <laughs> so there's actual value to that. So it, it's already picking up this discourse. So then the Philosopher Kings then, um, uh, it, so yeah, so, um, it, so what it does, it dissuades the, what's interesting about it, it dissuades the gold ruling class. So it, it, a lot of this discourse is actually targeting the, the rulers, that is the Philosopher Kings and the um, uh, guardians, uh, not to enslave the others because they are naturally superior and um, th so they're, they don't need, they, they're, they're made of gold and, and, and silver, so they don't need gold and silver. So it's sort of like I was saying about if you're, you're, you're already sweet enough, uh, you don't need sugar in your coffee, right? <laughs> so it's, this is the idea. They're, so they don't, they're, 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 they're not allowed to have wealth. Um, and, and that's the prevailing morality for them. So let's turn then to, uh, to slavery. Um, so we will be approaching it conceptually uh, and, um, as one, one, net, one field of it. So in um, their field changing classic metaphors uh, we live by, uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, I strongly recommend folks read this. Um, they argue that metaphors um, we live by are not simply just a matter of language. Um, that is, they're not mere words. They reflect how we understand certain structures of, uh, and how we think about certain things. They reflect the, the so yeah, how the tenor of the metaphor um, is, is structured by the vehicle and vice versa. So to illustrate, they use um, the metaphor, argument is war. Argument then is the tenor in this metaphor and war is the vehicle. And the vehicle is going to structure how we understand argument. War, is, war structures how we understand argument. So the metaphor reflects in Anglophone uh, culture uh, our understanding what arguments are. They're not simply like war. The concept of war structures the actions involved. Um, though there is no physical battle, quote, this is, this is quoting them, there is a verbal battle. Uh, the structure of an argument is attack, defense, counterattack, etc. All of this kind of language we're talking about arguments reflects that we, we, we think about it in terms of war. Uh, similarly, then, slavery functions as a cultural, uh, as a conceptual metaphor um, for being unable to resist carnal appetites and impulses. We talk about being enslaved to our passions, um, um, conceiving of passions as the enslaver. 
Um, now, the genealogy of this idea, the idea that uh, slave, that the conceptual metaphor of your uh, addictions being a passion can be traced directly to Socrates that we're talking about here, specifically um, in writers about him like Plato and Xenophon um, and others. And it, Professor Anthony Long um, recently suggested um, that the historical Socrates most likely play, quote, a significant role in popularizing the metaphor in philosophy. Indeed, Xenophon often uh, depicts him um, in the memorabilia as using slavery as a conceptual metaphor for incontinence. Accordingly, it's important then to keep in mind that Socrates is the narrator of the Republic. Right? So he's the one tell telling us the Republic. So everything has to be skewed through him. Um, and, and so uh, we should recognize then that the thematic significance of the metaphor whenever it shows up. So whenever we hear Socrates or the other characters talk about slavery or refer to people who are normally enslaved, we have to remember too that he's actually the one shaping their understanding of slavery as a way of thinking about being um, out of control of your passion. Okay. So the first two scenes then in book one highlight the conceptual metaphor that equates ruling with slavery as crucial um, to the central issue of the dialogue um, of, yeah, of enslaving, rather, ruling with enslaving, um, of whether it is better to live governed by justice or injustice. So each scene takes a different perspective on this metaphor. The first takes the perspective of the enslaver, and the second takes the perspective of the enslaved. So first, as Socrates and Glaucon, so this is going to be on the handout, uh, as so at first as Socrates and Glaucon are um, heading back to the upper city, it's the very opening of the dialogue, Polemarchus orders his slave to stop them from leaving the Piraeus. Polemarchus caught sight of us uh, from a distance as we were heading for home, and he ordered Achelusa, his slave, to run and order, Kelusai, us to wait for him. And the slave grabbed hold of Lambamenos, Lambamenos sorry, um, my cloak um, from behind and said, Polemarchus orders you, eh, you to wait. I turned around and asked where he was, and he's coming up behind you, he said, just to wait. All right, we'll wait, said Glaucon. Here, Polemarchus, a literal slaveholder, um, i.e. a despotes, uh, enacts his dominance over the body of the boy uh, who he has who is in his, is in his power. So through his, that is Polemarchus's violence back authority, he is able to have the enslaved boy grab Labamenos, that is physically assault uh, Socrates, and command him and Glaucon to wait. So when Polemarchus catches them, um, he somehow jokingly uses the threat of violence, pointing to the greater number of men among them, uh, to force Glaucon and Socrates to come home with him. The interaction is all very playful, but the image concretizes the mundane violence of slavery in Athens, which is the vehicle of the metaphor. So in, it is this casual violence that structures the concept of rule um, in terms of the actions involved in enslaving and slave holding. Now in the next scene, which is on the handout, um, Cephalus, Polemarchus's aged father, uh, deploys the metaphor itself when Socrates asks him what to expect in old age. And he criticizes his contemporaries who complain that they can't pursue their desires the way they could when they were younger. And he recalls meeting Sophocles, quote, indeed, I was once present when someone asked the poet Sophocles, how are you as far as sex goes, so Sophocles? Can you still make love with a woman? Quiet, man, the poet replied. I'm very glad to have escaped, apophugon, 
uh, from all of that, like a slave who has escaped from a savage and tyrannical master. So I thought that at the time he was right, and I still do, for old age brings peace and freedom from all such things. When the appetites relax and cease to importune us, everything Sophocles said comes to pass, and we escape from many mad masters. So in the word, in this, masters are despotes here. And so in the first instance, the perspective on slavery was that of the enslaver. Polymarchus was depicted as forcing the person enslaved to him to fulfill his desires. And here, the enslaved person's perspective is centered. When the enslaver is insane, slavery is excruciatingly unbearable. However, taken together with the first scene, the metaphor suggests that slavery is always unbearable or undesirable for the enslaved. Even when the enslaver is reasonable like Polymarchus, the enslaved still lives under the threat, constant threat of violence. Now in the first scene, however, an alternative conceptual metaphor um, for ruling is immediately provided. So we have ruling as dominating and um, enslaving, and now we have governance as persuasion is the second. Socrates offers to persuade Polymarchus to let them continue on their way. Polymarchus points out that people who are not listening can't be persuaded. However, before he can even reiterate this threat, like you look how big we are, um, Edimantus displays his preference for the alternative and persuades Socrates by appealing to his love for new spectacles, telling him about the torch relay on horseback that'll take place that evening. Polymarchus then charges, uh, changes tack and adding what he assumes would be another inducement, the all night conversation with young men. Persuasion works. So in Socrates' uh, first bout, and so moving forward in the, in, the, in the first book, in his first bout with uh, Thrasymachus, and I use bout here because in this dialogue for sure, uh, argument is war. Um, Thrasymachus' definition of justice as the interest of the stronger, um, Socrates gets his opponent to equate the stronger with the ruler. An easy concession um, to achieve since Thrasymachus clearly understands ruling as domination. Socrates uh, then turns his argument on its head, forcing the conclusion that no ruler, archon, not despotes, um, insofar as he is a ruler, really seeks his own advantage, but only the advantage of the ruled, um, over whom he practices the craft of ruling, which is demiurgain, which interestingly is a word for like craft making, which is of course going to be the iron group, right, the bottom group there. So. That is how it, so, so it's really important to then pay attention to the kinds of language that he's using because it implies the metaphors, conceptual metaphors he's working with. So Symmachus then responds um, by first, of course, insulting Socrates, effectively calling him an overgrown baby, saying, oh, he doesn't know about sheep and shepherds. And then introduces a conceptual metaphor drawn from Homer. So he, quote, this should be on the handout. You think that shepherds and cowherds seek the good of their sheep and cattle and fatten them and take care of them, looking um, to something other than their master's good and their uh, own than their own. Moreover, um, you believe that rulers in cities, true rulers that is, think their subjects differently um, than the ones than one does sheep. And that, and that uh, day and night, or night and day, right, they think of something besides their own advantage. You are so far from understanding about justice and what's just, about injustice and what's unjust, that you don't realize that justice is really the good of another, the advantage of the stronger, 
the ruler and the harmful and harmful to those who obeys and serves injustice is the opposite it rules the truly simple and just and does it um and and th and those it rules do what uh what is to its advantage of the other and stronger, and they make the one that, uh, they serve happy, but they themselves not at all. And one of the, th the tricks that Socrates tends to do is uh, be very precise in his language. And so, and Thrasymachus was also known for being very precise. So Socrates uh, is able to come at him at that. Socrates, Th Thrasymachus's use of the shepherd King metaphor here is really crucial, though, for struct for as a structuring vehicle for shepherd. So he's saying, your idea of the the you're, you're thinking of the shepherd as as the ruler, or you should be thinking of the shepherd as a ruler. And if that's the case, then he's working with this particular conceptual metaphor that he gets from Homer. Uh, he it's a, it's the idea of the poem men allow on, which uh, is the shepherd of the people. You find this in Homer. Um, and the metaphor, this metaphor then structures governing um, in terms of shepherding, right? Um, now, it's hard in our post-Christian universe to think of it because for us, the good shepherd, all of that is all very positive. But in antiquity, or certainly Greek antiquity, we were talking about the, the shepherd is not a positive image. So this is something to, to get, get, and I'm going to try to explain, explain that through the, the Homer. Um, so Pomen Alaon is associated most closely in the Iliad with Agamemnon, right? And um, significantly in book one of the Agamemnon, where we, or the, of the Agamemnon, big not, book one of the Iliad, where we have the quarrel between Achilles and um, Agamemnon breaks out, and Achilles viciously criticizes Agamemnon's style of ruling, curling all kinds of insults um, at him, um, very colorful, of course, um, that were excised by later scholars of the text. Um, but he gives him the title Demoboros Basileus, uh, devourer of the people, the king that devours the people, right? Uh, so this is the metaphor uh, that we're thinking of when we think of the poem in Alaon. So um, Thrasymachus is ruling is shepherding, is ruling like Agamemnon, right? Um, means dominating is shepherding. So Socrates then responds to Thrasymachus's shepherd king metaphor by reminding him of his own, Thrasymachus's own insistence on using precise terms. So he catches him out here. You see Thrasymachus, uh, that's on the handout, um, that having defined the true doctor, to continue examining things as you said before, you didn't consider it necessary later to keep a precise guard on the true shepherd. You think that insofar as he's a shepherd, he fattens the sheep, not looking to what is best for the sheep, but the banquet as a guest about to be entertained at the feast uh, or to a future uh, sale like a moneymaker rather than a shepherd. Shepherding is concerned with providing what is best for that which is set over. And it is itself adequately provided with all the needs to be, um, to be it as best when it is, doesn't fall short in any way of being the craft of shepherding. So this is tyranny, he says. Uh, through which stealth or force appropriates the property of others, whether sacred or profane, public or private, um, not little by little, but all at once. This is really, I want you to remember this, this, this reference to taking everybody's property all at once, because <laughs> it's going to come back up. Um, so if someone commits only one part of injustice and is caught, he's punished and greatly reproached. Uh, such party... Such partly unjust people are called temple robbers, kidnappers, homebreakers, robbers, and thieves when they commit these crimes. But when someone, in addition to appropriating their possession, kidnaps and enslaves the citizens as well, um, in, instead of uh, these shameful names, he is called happy and blessed 
but only by the citizens themselves, but by all who learn what he has done uh, is the whole of injustice. Now, Thrasymachus is conceptual metaphor, shepherding is tyranny, uh, yes, is um, drawn, as I said, from Homer. And in Homer, uh, the metaphor structures governing in terms of shepherding. However, in the Iliad and Odyssey, as an epithet, oh, I think I read this part already. Oops, this is a, this is a reduplication. <laughs> Sorry, we'll skip over, yeah. That. So it's worth observing then. Now, we're going to go to the uh, Gyges uh, story. So um, it's, it's worth observing that Gyges, uh-oh, so, so hold on a second. Oh, OK, sorry, my papers were all fixed up. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so, so according to, back to the, the definition of, of, of um, shepherds there. So according to Socrates then, the metaphor is true shepherd is true ruler. So we, we had the bad shepherd, Agamemnon like shepherd is a tyrant shepherd. Shepherd is tyrant. And, then, and we also bring in um, that. And Socrates is saying, no, no, no. A true shepherd, if we're going to use ruling the shepherd king, then the true shepherd is the true ruler. And the shepherd is only interested in shepherding, not in money making, not in banqueting, not in cooking, etc. So ruling is taking care and not exploiting or enslaving the ruled. So lurking behind Thrasymachus's shepherd is tyrant is a historical reality. In Athenian and other ancient Mediterranean societies, shepherds were a recognizable group of enslaved persons. Moreover, there was a long tradition going all the way back as far as the Iliad and the Odyssey of discourses that justified and naturalized the enslaved uh, dehumanizing and slave treatment of shepherds. Um, and it's through the discourse of monstrosity, mythological discourse of monstrosity, um, equating them with the Cyclopes. So if you'll remember in the Odyssey, the Cyclops is a shepherd, <laughs> right? And then in the, at the end of the, the Odyssey, you'll recall that the bad shepherds are punished in a very uh, atrocious way, like he's uh, mutilated and made to be a column in the house as a uh, sort of warning to the others. But the, but the point being, he couldn't do that to um, someone he didn't think of as subhuman, right? Okay, so the racial prejudice uh, that, uh, the metaphor thus uh, reflects this unarticulated racial ideology that prevents enslaved persons, in this case shepherds, from gaining political power. We can't have shepherds ruling because they're going to be tyrants. Um, the implication is that if a shepherd gained political power, he would be a tyrant. The racial prejudice then against shepherds in, built into Thrasymachus's shepherd-tyrant analogy becomes explicit then in Glaucon's story about how Gyges dynasty was founded in Lydia. As a strong formulation of Thrasymachus's argument, Glaucon now argues that, well, people are naturally um, inclined to commit injustice, that is, not want uh, reciprocity. So the, 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 the Greek word for justice is dike, which is at the root of it is the idea of reciprocity. Right? So um, adikeia is, is an imbalance of uh, treatment. So he's saying that it's natural for people to want to take advantage of others, uh, uh, commit injustice, and get away with it. So Gyges gained this power while he was, lo and behold, chasing his sheep, right? Uh, so the free, the, and he says, okay, now he's going to tell the story. So the freedom I'm talking about, Glaucon's saying, this is on the handout. The freedom I'm talking about, exousia, um, I mentioned, um, would be most easily realized if both people had the power, dunamin, um, they say the ancestor of Gyges of Lydia possessed. The story goes that he was a shepherd working for, um, and it, here's Poimen uh, Theotuon, so he's an enslaved shepherd, uh, the ruler of Lydia. And there, um, was a violent thunderstorm and an earthquake 
uh, broke open the ground and created a chasm at the place where he was tending his sheep. Seeing this, he was filled with amazement and went down in it. And there, in addition to many other wonders of which he, we're told, he saw a hollow bronze horse. And there were window-like openings in it and, he, and peeped in it, and he saw a corpse, which seemed to him of more than human size, and is wearing nothing but a gold ring on its finger. And he took the ring and came out of the chasm. I always worry, why, why didn't he take anything else? Like, <laughs> Why just the ring, right? But anyway, he does. He takes the, takes the ring. And he wore the ring at the annual uh, meeting uh, that was to, be to make a report to the king on the state of the flocks. So this is a kind of democratic boule that they have where the shepherds are in a democratic setup, right? Um, and um, as he was sitting there among the others, he happened to turn the setting of the ring towards himself to the inside of his hand. And then um, as he did this, he became invisible to those sitting near him. And they went on talking as if he was gone. And he wondered at this and then, and fingering the ring, he turned um, the setting to outside again and became visible. So he experimented with the ring to the test whether it indeed had this power and it did. And if he turned the setting inward, he became invisible. If he turned it outward, he became visible again. So when he realized this, he was at once, he at once arranged to become the one the messengers would send to the king. And when he arrived there, he seduced the king's wife, attacked the king with her help, killed him, took over the kingdom. So it's worth observing then that Gaiji's ancestor started off as a shepherd, right? Again, in this concept, an enslaved, an enslaved to the king, whom he later slew and whose wife uh, um, and throne he stole. It's also significant that as slaves of the king, the shepherds rule themselves in a kind of democratic setup. Uh, and they meet in an assembly and make collective decisions. So Glaucon's story reveals the fear that enslavers like him have of their, their enslaved rising up against them. The shepherds are particularly worrisome in antiquity uh, for uh, many reasons, not the least being that they were one of the few enslaved persons to carry weapons, because you need to fight off wolves and whatever when you're protecting the sheep. And the Romans have all kinds of laws about who can, how much, what kind of weapons you can have your shepherds have and the, the, because of slave revolts that always uh, broke out led by shepherds. So the ring of invisibility was this weapon that Gaiji's ancestor used to commit injustices necessar necessary to overthrow the Lydian king. So the shepherd becomes a tyrant. So the story this illustrates Glaucon's point then that given the chance to do whatever injustice one likes to others, provided that there's no consequences, everyone would commit injustices against others. And then the worst nightmare for uh, someone like Glaucon would occur. You would have the, uh, those who should be ruled, the enslaved, ruling over you. Okay? That, that's, that's built into to the, the idea here. So it needs to be stressed then that um, the same power that the ring gave Gaiji's ancestor is precisely the power that enslavers actually have over uh, the persons they enslave. They, they can do all kinds of injustices without consequence. So that's already built in. So, it's, so this is how he starts the dialogue. And all of these themes get picked up later in, um, in book eight when we find the devolution from the Callipolis. So let's first talk about the Callipolis. Now, although Socrates, um, so we think about, well, how does the, they, the, Socrates um, comes up with the idea his first idea of what a just state is, is the, what we call the city of pigs, where everyone is uh, equal and doing whatever. So it's a kind of already a kind of democratic, perhaps even anarchic society, but it's not satisfactory to uh, Glaucon and the others because there's none of the things that they like in life. So although he addresses uh, a wide range of issues in constructing the Callipolis, there is relatively little concern we notice in when he's talking about it, once they get it set up, that he doesn't talk about slavery explicitly. So first he discusses slavery um, in 
the, his account of the noble lie, the foundation of the myth at the very center of the Calypolis' elaborate education and cultural program, and so this is on the handout. The noble lie consists in of two potentially opposite, I don't, maybe it is on the handout, I think it is, um, two potentially opposite the uh, claims. One, that all the residents of the Calypolis are earthborn, Gaganes, from the very land on which the city is located and are by birth cognate with one another. That is, they are all in the sense family. So that's Republic 414. Um, and then the three, the ruler, three or four classes of the city, rulers, military, and then the craftsmen, which can be whooped the one or two, they are different kinds. And the, the word is gene, which later um, race scientists tend to translate as race, but it, it just means kinds. Um, whose natures differ fundamentally from one another by virtue of this metallurgic thing I've been talking about. Now, when considered independently from one another, each of these claims uh, makes a straightforward contribution to the stability of the Calypolis. So while the first encourages each of the different members of the city to view the city as their mother and their fellow citizens as family, um, the other dissuades um, the ruling group from oppressing the others and also the, the ruled from wanting to take on the position of, the, of, of rulership. So the, that point is that this story that they're all brought up with means it justifies why so, so uh, different people are in power and why we should be okay with it, why we should accept that the rulers are just better than we are in every way and uh, we, the ruled, especially the iron people, we're just not. So this, this bothers um, me and, and, and uh, my, my, my co-author a lot. Um, he's more concerned with the fact that the iron and the bronze uh, can't vote, right? Uh, because uh, th th that, that's the, the real harm in his view. And my view is that you know, there's a prior to that harm, which is the idea that they can't actually see of themselves as anything other than how they have been told that they are inferior. To me, that's a greater harm than not being able to vote. That's the next step, that's just like goes hand in hand with that. So there's, so there's this massive harm that is um, already built into the so-called just state, right? That, um, you know, we should be really concerned about. So at the, at the so it's, it's important then to see that, well, this just state isn't really as it's presented in the, in the dialogue, it isn't really the, the, the just state that Socrates had in mind, right? The, the first city is the, is the city he had in mind. And then um, the Glaucon and Adamantus, or particularly Glaucon, say, well, that, but, but there's no spices, there's none of the things that we would want to, we wouldn't want to live there. That's a city of pigs, Socrates, that's um, changing. And so he's, and he says to them, oh, I see what you wanted was a luxurious city. You didn't really want a just city. You just wanted a luxurious city. So, so that's, it's important then to, to, to remember then that Calypolis is already not a perfectly just state. Um, but even in that case, it does, it, as far as we can tell, there is no reason to believe that there is, an, is slavery, or certainly it is not a, a state built on slavery. Um, the, David makes a, tries to make a very strong case that, uh, like the, he gives a strong argument that there is absolutely no slavery in the, um, in the, in the, in the Calypolis. Um, I would sort of agree, I would be a bit more cautious and say, um, well, there probably is, but it's probably to do with uh, people who are uh, prisoners. It's a way of dealing with uh, crime, if there is any. Right? When people do get out of hand, that might be what happens. Because they certainly, it's what's, what's clear is that these, the Calypolis does not engage in aggressive wars, which what, the purpose of aggressive wars in antiquity was to get slaves. That's the, the point, right? You sack the city, you get the goods, you get the women, kill all the men, and, and you enslave the women. So they don't engage in, um, in that kind of warfare. And, and, in, and he explicitly says that even if we are attacked, the Calypolis is attacked, um, what we can do is make alliances with the other cities around us and tell them they can take all the spoils and we, you know, we just, just keep us safe. So, so the idea of having slaves in the state 
um, is not okay for them, right? Um, so so that, that's important. This is, uh, cynically, we think that this is also another reason why perhaps Plato's ideas of slavery were not as popular as, say, Aristotle's, especially during the antebellum era. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm gonna skip along and just trust me, David makes a good case that uh, the Calypolis has no slavery <laughs> and move on to the, the, the um, how we get slavery then in the Calypolis, right? Um, so uh, what we have is, so first Socrates discusses um, slave owning. The first time he, he does, discusses it uh, in detail is when um, he turns to the decline of the Calypolis in, um, into four different uh, progressive groups, and that's in book eight, and then so that it's like 547. Um, so if you're looking for the passage on the handout, it's going to be 547b, 7c, etc. So, so yeah. So according to Socrates, the fall of the Calypolis um, begins when rulers fail to maintain this metallurgic purity uh, among the ruling classes, leading to um, uh, them uh, they're basically disuniting or disunity among them. And uh, so it's clear that there's there, the way it's set up, it's, it's quite funny to read it, where the idea, they, they say, okay, well, okay, now we have to move on to talk about what is the most unjust person. So we need the most unjust state. How do we get from our Calypolis to this unjust state? I don't know, let's ask the muses. And <laughs> so they get the muses in, and then the muses tell them, um, you know, uh, a story that involves some kind of math. I always feel that whenever there's math, going on in the Republic, Plato's just trying to blind you there, like with eh, scientific lingo. But the point is that they, they, there's some mess up in the calculations about who is to marry who, and um, we end up with mixed uh, groups. So, and the first group, first sort of uh, mixture is the wife is from the silver and the husband is, first of all, they have families, that's also important. So we now have individual families, and then we have the wife is silver and the husband is gold. And um, what happens is the husband um, is being a philosopher, is only really interested in philosophy, and so he's not really interested in pursuing uh, power, which the, the silver group actually is pursuing power because they are the military. Right, and so she's henpecking him. <laughs> Use a very misogynist term, <laughs> but she's nagging him about how he's he's not um, doing what he should be doing to get her, you know, up among the the, the female uh, of the of the uh, group. And so what happens is uh, her son watches this, and then he starts wanting to have money and wealth and power. So what's what's happened then is we've broken down the checks and balances between the family and these, uh, the, the silver, gold, bronze being actually what they really are on the inside, and now they need it on the outside. They start accumulating wealth, hiding it in treasuries, we're told, um, but because it's not still not okay, like morally, for them to have wealth, but they do. And, and what, one of the things that the, the original um, noble lie did was he prevented you from translating your wealth into power. The, the people that had wealth actually were the iron and bronze. They are the ones that had possessions. They're the ones that had wealth. And, and the, the, the setup was such that they could not translate their wealth into power, right? But now, because the, 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 the democratic spirit is starting to dominate, the, the desire for um, was it, expressions of your honor being in terms of wealth, this starts to uh, change the dynamic of the, of the society. And um, so after fighting, and so the civil war takes place, so after fighting and straining one another, they, they agree to dis distribute the lands, so and remember they kept the land in common, now, we, now we're having private property, and um, houses as private property, and to enslave and hold as slaves, the, the tra translation here is serfs, but that's actually not as accurate. That sort of brings in medieval ideas. It's not, it's, they're, they're gonna be slaves um, and slaves, so there's three different kinds of slaves. <laughs> um, those who were previously 
they guard it as free friends, and it's not friends here, it's family members, philoi is the Greek word, um, and provided for um, their upkeep, at, who provided their upkeep and um, to occupy themselves with war and guarding against those whom they've now enslaved. So basically, this, the society falls due to this um, desire to accumulate wealth, and um, they immediately turn to enslaving the people within their society, right? The, the um, iron and bronze. And now the noble lie discourse becomes a racial discourse because now we are the gold and silver. We are not only we are superior, but we're also going to treat you as inferior such that we are enslaving you, we're policing you. And they effectively establish this police state. Now, this is the second most just city. Just, just so you get that right. So you have the Caliphalus, and then the first step down is pretty much a police state. Okay, that's kind of scary, <laughs> right? Now, um, so according to Socrates, then the mass enslavement of the bronze and iron classes is among the very first constitutive actions taken by the democratic state. And he emphasizes this in in this passage. Um, the democratic rulers um, not only exploit the bronze and iron classes by enslaving them, but in doing so, they betray their longstanding status as friends and family, Philoi. This passage also emphasizes the radical transformation of the democratic rulers' concept of rule insofar as shifting it from guarding and taking care of the people to exploiting and guarding against them. So the injustice of their action thus extends beyond the intrinsic injustice of enslavement to quasi-familial betrayal, um, anticipating the tyrant's later uh, betrayal of even his parents in the nadir of Socrates' survey of the defective character types. And it's worth noting that although the democratic rulers have presumably abandoned the view, inculcated the noble lie that um, all that all the members of the society are extended family, the myth of the medals seems to remain operative um, insofar as access to military and political influence in the society con uh, continues to determine whether one is uh, gold, is de determined by whether one is gold, silver, etc. So, the, so we're going to keep it the same way, so we don't change the myth that much, like we don't change things um, too radically. But what we, what we do now, in, 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 how we keep the uh, iron and bronze people in their place is by overt violence instead of persuasion, which was the Calipolis version. Now we have overt violence. So as far as the bronze and iron classes go, uh, they lose not only their wealth, but also, as we've seen, their sense of familial ties with the bronze with the gold and silver, which implies that uh, the right to be treated with dignity by them. Thus, the process of enslaving them deprives them of their earlier dignified position in the Calipolis. And in this respect, Plato's view aligns well with the Homeric view in the Odyssey, which actually goes against the view that um, you have in uh, Aristotle's view, um, where he, in the Odyssey you have half of his excellent, a person's excellence, broad seeing Zeus removes from a man whenever, whensoever the day of slavery overpowers him. So slavery is what makes you inferior, not that you are inferior um, and, and therefore deserve to be enslaved. Uh, so so in, already in the Odyssey, that's the view. Um, so Odysseus's comment is made to Eumaeus, uh, who's, the, who's the enslaved shepherd or, or pig swineherd, um, highlights, uh, the racialization as a process, right? And in the Calipolis, the bronze and iron classes were treated with human dignity because they were family. But now in the democracy, they're treated with exceptional cruelty, uh, which is justified and naturalized by their status as bronze and iron. So you can see how now the, the discourse has, has, has shifted slightly, uh, but basically, uh, we still have th why things are the way they are, why they need to stay that way is still operating. So Socrates' account of the origins of slavery in the democracy, namely the desire of the bronze and iron types within the silver and gold, right? So now, because you're having a mixture and now some of the silver and the gold have bronze and iron in them. So it's, 
and that's why they're uh, wanting uh, their possessions. So his account then, um, that's among the elite, uh, and they're, yeah, so yeah, namely the desire for bronze, the desire of the bronze and gold types in the elite to want wealth and luxury um, beyond just the basic goods um, supplied to them in the Calypolis is strikingly similar to the account that he gives of why we're going from the city of pigs to Calypolis in the first place, but also the origins of war and by implication of slavery in, early, in book two of the Republic. Socrates discusses the origins of war as part of his discussion um, in, in, in the origins of political community more generally. And according to him, political communities first arise because of their inability to con uh, consistently and reliably satisfy their own basic needs. People need each other. Yeah. And, uh, and, in a, and they need to be in a community. So the idea of like being a politikon zo and humans need to live in a community. As Socrates uh, describes, the guiding principle of the first city is that is the principle of specialization. So he has everyone doing their, their thing. But he first introduces military and a, a military and a government um, in reply to an objection by Glaucon who criticizes the simple lifestyle of the inhabitants of the city who live um, in his view, a life worthy of pigs rather than humans. And in response, Socrates turns uh, to his second model of a city, the luxurious one that we have. And so it's this feverish city because they need more land, they need more goods. This is in the Calypolis, still like the, as they're building the Calypolis. This is the origin of war. It's the origin of war is to acquire more wealth. So although the Greek text leaves um, what things are most uh, of all uh, responsible for the political and individual uh, bads um, a bit undetermined. In the context, so uh, Socrates seems to have in mind especially the limitless desire for wealth and the pursuit of unnecessary luxury goods that um, could, as part of his description of, of what's wrong and what's causing uh, trouble. But the minute you're introducing war, it means, certainly in the Greek context, it means um, enslaving people. So uh, we have to then dial back the, the, the Calypolis, and that's when they introduce all the education for the guardians. So the final bit, let's talk about the tyranny and then this, get back to this idea of the psychology of slavery. So although, um, of the defective cities, so we've gone from democracy and then there's oligarchy, and now we're at tyranny. <laughs> so we just, like, we just zip through um, into that. Um, although, so now we have mass slavery in all these levels, right? Um, and what's, it's worth bearing in mind that all of these cities that he's talking about are actually existing in his world. They, their democracies exist, that's Sparta, um, you know, Crete, etc. There, there are democracies, there were oligarchies, there were democracies and there were tyranny. So, uh, but in this case of tyranny, um, it's, it's most likely that he's talking about tyranny in terms of um, the Athenian con con conception of tyranny arising out of the democratic, uh, corruption of the democratic state. So, uh, so tyranny, in his view, then develops out of democracy. And, and it's, it's, I should also mention too that he says that there are a plethora of uh, possible states we could talk about, we're just going to talk about these. So it's, so he, so it's not that he only thinks these are, the, or this, this is the only trajectory you can have. He's, he's, he's edited out a whole bunch, including monarchy and all kinds of things he's edited out, because he really just wants to t get to this issue of, of tyranny, right? Tyranny coming out of democracy. And it's the, there, he describes the transition to tyranny as, quote, a change to extreme slavery. I thought it was extreme at the beginning when we had a whole state enslaved, and, but okay, we're now at extreme slavery, um, whether for a private individual or the city. Um, a line later, he described. You know, a line later, he describes tyranny as quote the most severe and cruel slavery. Uh, among other lines, at the end of book eight, he des he describes the condition of most people in a tyranny as quote in the harshest and most bitter slavery. So thus, despite the mass enslavement of the bronze and, and iron classes in democracy, slavery under the tyranny is even more extreme, 
cruel and bitter in Socrates' view. So while tyranny, as Socrates constructs it, seems like a perfectly bad city, um, and so the site of extreme form of nearly, social, every, near, nearly all social ills, it is worth asking why he takes slavery within tyranny to be even more extreme than slavery in democracy. After all, not only are the vast majority of the inhabitants of democracy enslaved by the rulers, but in Socrates' description, the Timocrats are, as we have seen, exceptionally cruel masters. Now, in a certain sense, Socrates' response here is straightforward, namely the worst aspects of, of slavery under democracy are only further amplified in the democratic state. For instance, Socrates, uh, just as he describes it, uh, a, an even greater portion of the population of, uh, um, is under, in, in a tyranny is enslaved. So presumably it was only the iron and the bronze were enslaved. Now some of the gold and the silver are also being enslaved. And this is why it's particularly conceived of as cruel um, for him. So, so in addition to describing the most extreme slavery in tyrannical states, Socrates also gives a great deal of attention to the sense in which the tyrannical person is enslaved in their own des baser desires. And as we see, the tyrannical person is dominated uh, by the very appetites that Socrates singles out um, in his account of the origins of slavery back in book two. For instance, after establishing that, in effect, the whole tyrannical city is enslaved, so Socrates asked Glaucon about the tyrannical man. Then if um, man and city, this is 577D, I don't know what number it is on the handout, but close to the end. <laughs> uh, then if uh, man and city are alike, mustn't the same structure be in him too? And mustn't his soul be full of slavery and freedom, un unfreedom? and the most decent parts of the enslaved and with the small part, the maddest and most vicious part as its master, it must. So like the tyrannical city, then the tyrannical person himself is ruled by his maddest and most vicious part. And it is not simply that the tyrannical person is dominated by appetite instead of reason or spirit, but is, as Socrates uh, argues later in Book Nine, by a particularly dangerous, wild, and lawless form of appetite um, that pursues, uh, uh, yeah, that pursues intense physical and especially sexual pleasure without restraint, even if its pursuits lead to, to incest, bestiality, or cannibalism. So while the rest of us experience such appetites. At most in our dreams, the single-minded pursuit of intense pleasure at any cost dominates the life of the tyrant, uh, subordinating reason and spirit entirely to its pursuit. And it's worth um, contrasting the sense in which the tyrant is enslaved to his lawless appetites with Socrates' account of the oligarchic person um, who is dominated by um, also by appetite, but in case of the dominant, uh, the oligarchic person, their desires tend again toward uh, uh, wealth accumulation. So Socrates describes that although base appetites, kakos atumias, are present in the oligarchic person, um, the more decent parts of his soul are still holding them in check. Um, not by persuading them as uh, that is uh, not by persuading them that it is better not to act on them or taming them with arguments, but by compulsion and fear and trembling of the rest of his property. So the reason why the oligarchic guy doesn't go all into cannibalism is because he's worried about losing his property to the law, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so reason and spirit, uh, the more decent parts of the soul, therefore, play an important role in shaping the oligarchic person, whereas in the tyrant, there is nothing uh, there. So to conclude, so I, there's a lot more I could go into and I could take, certainly take uh, questions, but um, in this talk, we've tried to explore some of the aspects of the imagery and theory of slavery in Plato's Republic. As we have argued, um, slavery plays a especially important and persuasive role in Plato's account of political decline. And in particular, 
uh, the imp introduction of slavery marks the, tradition, the transition from both the first just city to the luxurious city, and also from the Callipolis to the defective historical cities of book eight and nine. While it's often argued that the Greeks could hardly imagine a city without slavery, we hoped uh, to have shown that there is strong reason to think that uh, there were no slaves in the Callipolis. And one of the points that I skipped over was the fact that uh, Socrates says that the tyrannical guy, what if he, what if the tyrannical city is then surrounded by cities where they don't allow slavery and that they're actually willing to go to war with them over it? Right? And again, why are, did we not study Plato? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, and um, so he's, he can't imagine states that don't have slavery, right? Um, so it's not just, oh, they didn't have the capacity to, to think that they did. Um, so, uh, so while it to be, well, to be sure, this may by no means implies that uh, Plato is opposed to slavery in other Greek states around him, it does suggest that his view of slavery as, at best, as, as he viewed it as a necessary evil in existing cities and one that has no place at all in an ideal just city. So that's where I'll end. Thank you. <laughs>